very good evening today yes for the past two years we know physicians pulmonologists across the country are eagerly waiting for cca webinar this evening cca has come out with a brilliant concept of how to manage prolonged ventilated patients particularly in covid covid for the past couple of years we have seen easy cases moderate cases severe cases but when cases have become severe invariably they need ventilator support earlier in few cca webinars we have discussed discussed thoroughly when to when that these patients require ecmo and what are the intricacies in management of ecmo uh, ecmo place patients and today we are going to discuss in detail about what are the intricacies and <laughs> always ventilation is an art it is very very unusual focus we cannot have universal um, guidelines or universally you know one uh, set of modes to ventilate our patients but what are the troubles that we come across in ventilating these patients and what are the factors that are going to influence a positive outcome that are going to influence mortality these are all minute details we are going to discuss today we have a elite panel today with us dr jay raman very good friend of mine from chennai we worked together at apollo greens road in way back in 2000 i believe 2005 2006 and uh, dr jay raman is a senior consultant working with apollo fastmed and mgm healthcare chennai welcome dr jay raman coming to dr virender vadgonkar another good friend cci i can say a latest entry into cci club welcome to cci uh, dr virendra and he is uh, currently practicing at aurangabad in orion critical care super specialty hospital welcome to the forum and uh, dr jv pravin another vice candidate pulmonologist from my alumni that is andhra medical college visakhapatnam is currently assistant professor at government hospital for chest and communicable disease wisac a brilliant person and looking forward for his inputs as well today today uh, these three gigants will talk on what are the various factors that are going to decide uh, uh, in mortality and morbidity of these patients by dr virender ecmo intricacies will be uh, dealt by dr jay raman and uh, dr jv pravin will talk on how beautifully we can how smoothly we we can wean our ventilated patients those are the talks initial probably roughly they are going to take 30 35 minutes please focusly listen Uh, to these talks and then put your all your queries so that the discussion will be very vibrant and uh, i sincerely thank dr n h krishna a chairman trustee dr narayan pradeepa dr narendra mithuku dr ravi dosi dr atri an entire sipla team for giving me this opportunity and uh, over to dr virendra
गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आई एम डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र वडगावकर फ्रॉम औरंगाबाद चेस्ट फिजिशियन वेलकम टू द चेस्ट काउंसिल ऑफ इंडिया सब्जेक्ट लाइक मैनेजमेंट ऑफ प्रोलॉन्ग वेंटिलेशन इन कोविड पेशेंट्स बेसिकली इट इज अ वेरी वास्ट सब्जेक्ट एंड वील बी डू डिस्कसिंग इट विद इन वन आवर the subject given to me is uh, factors for survival or mortality in mechanically ventilated covid patients so we'll start it directly i think covid 19 is a uh, covid 19 pandemic we have seen this is a major pandemic after so many of years uh, since last two years we are going through it it is primary respiratory disease or uh, it uh, Uh, transmit through droplets in close contacts common presenting complaints are fever cough and breathlessness we know it the presentation of the covid 19 ranges from asymptomatic patients to pneumonia to sepsis to septic shock to ards so we'll be discussing following factors for long term long term survival in covid 19 patients on ventilator mechanical ventilation of course so the factors are age sex bmi comorbidity in a patient days of symptoms or to admission or days of admission to uh, mechanical ventilation inflammatory markers ct scan score inotropic uh, agent requirement renal replacement therapy ventilatory complications ards and secondary bacterial and fungal infections so first we'll start with the age uh, of course elderly patients are at high risk more than uh, 60 years of age are at highest risk but age could not be a factor for initiation of mechanical ventilation so any uh, aged patient we can start mechanical ventilation sex females may may have a slightly better chance of survival may be due to lower cardiovascular risk uh, than males but we don't don't know that it may be equal uh, bmi body mass index um, obesity is a major risk factor we know it is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease diabetes and uh, we know the it causes respiratory respiratory diseases also like uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome or osa obstructive sleep apnea causing hypercapnia in some patients so it is a major risk factor high bmi patients are at high risk normal bmi is 20 to 26 we know uh, the uh, next factor is comorbidities uh, patient can can have multiple comorbidities and there are multiple uh, many number of comorbidities to say but major com- comorbidities are hypertension diabetes iid like post cabg post plastic patient ckd malignancy especially blood malignancies like leukemia and lymphomas ild ipf uh these patients have very low uh, respiratory uh, reserve and immunocompromised patients or um, drugs on uh, or patients on uh, immunocompromised uh, immunosuppression drugs next factor is uh, days days from the initiation of symptoms to the presentation to the hospital and patient admission uh, days from admission to hospital to uh, shifting to icu and uh, to mechanical ventilation so during this period mode of oxygen supply what was the mode of oxygen supply or respiratory support like high flow nasal oxygen cannula or niv non invasive ventilator or patient was on bipap failed attempt of prolong niv support this is a major risk factor we have to uh, know the point at which point uh, we should uh, mechanically ventilate the patient and how much stretch and uh, how, uh, how much to stretch on a niv support so this is a major uh, factor uh, next is serum inflammatory markers so there are many markers we have seen uh, during treatment of covid 19 but may uh, main are crp d dimer ferritin il6 levels procalcitonin and nlr that is neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio so first is the crp it is a general inflammatory marker normal level is 0 to 10 high or very high crp suggests progressive inflammation and may suggest to severe disease requiring admission but crp does not uh, detect cause or location of the inflammation so along with other markers it is a, um, uh, a significant uh, thing next is ferritin normal range is uh, you know 3 to 330 microgram elevated ferritin level suggests inflammation higher the ferritin level worse is the prognosis serially rising trend of the ferritin uh, could denote the cytokine storm along with other markers and possibility of pro thrombotic event next is d dimer d dimer normal d dimer level is 0 to 0.5 uh, d dimer helps to rule out the pulmonary embolism next is il6 il6 is one of the key cytokine uh, after activated macrophages normal normal range is 0 to 16 
10 times rise in IL-6 along with high, very high CRP, elevated ferritin levels or severely elevation of in these markers along with high NLR uh, with raised oxygen requirement of the patient suggest cytokine storm. So this is a major risk factor. Uh, use of, uh, we use uh, injection tocilizumab, steroids and uh, baricitinib during this storm. Next is procalcitonin level. It is a biological marker sensitive and specific to, to, uh, specific to sepsis uh, due to bacterial infection. It is mentioned in the surviving, uh, surviving sepsis campaign. Uh, so serum procal level more than 2 suggests high risk of progression to sepsis or septic shock. Uh, PCT level has, uh, if PCT level has not declined, we have to reassess the antibiotic therapy. It also guides us to reduce the steroid dose or, or not to use uh, tocilizumab in cytokine storm. So decline from a peak of uh, pre, uh, from a peak more than 80% from the peak, it suggests the clinical improvement in a patient. Uh, one factor is NLR, that is neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. NLR is more than 15 is associated with increased mortality and it is useful prognostic factor in COVID-19 patients on mechanical ventilation. So next is, uh, after these markers, it is a radiological uh, <coughs> diagnosis like a CT scan score. We have done uh, HRCT test in my many COVID-19 patients and it shows bilateral ground glass opacities in some, mostly in subpleural area. Individual low bar scores based on percentage of the involvement is done and some of the individual low bar score indicate the overall severity of the phylo. So 0 to 8 score is a mild score, 9 to 15 is moderate and 16 to 25 is a severe score, uh, CT scan score. CT score more than 16 positively correlate with the raised inflammatory markers and severity of the clinical, uh, clinical disease and patient going uh, on a mechanical ventilation. Next is inotropic agents. So uh, generally mechanically ventilation, uh, ventilated patient generally require an uh, inotropic agent just after the intubation or for a small period of time. But pay a high dose of inotropes, uh, use of multiple inotropes for number of days, it increases the risk in the mechanically ventilated patients. Renal replacement therapy, it, a patient required hemodialysis or SLED. Uh, are at higher risk. Oliguria along with metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia require hemodialysis. Uh, two or three settings, it is okay, but more, if patient requires more than three settings of dialysis, it is again a high risk for these patients. Uh, ventilatory supports and it, its complication. We know generally prolonged ventilatory patients undergo early tracheostomy, are given prone position ventilation, positive expiratory and expiratory pressure, that is PEEP is a mode of therapy in mechanical ventilation. It recruits the <coughs> closed alveoli and improves the oxygenation. High PEEP indicates severe ARDS it may, and it may cause barotrauma and lead to pneumothorax. It is again a high risk uh, for this patient. We have ventilator associated pneumonia is a major complication in prolonged ventilation. Especially these COVID-19 patients are given um, higher doses of steroids or uh, immunosuppression for the cytokine storm. So this is uh, a major complication. Uh, so this is a Berlin ARDS criteria. It is a clinical insult occurring within one week with bilateral opacities on imaging causing respiratory failure with following oxygenation criteria. Is PA, we know it is a PO2, PFO2 ratio, uh, 300 to 200 mm of Hg, it is a mild disease, 200 to 100 it is a moderate disease and less than 100 mm of Hg, it is a severe disease with PEEP requirement of more than 5 cm of water. Uh, so this is the ARDS criteria and hypercapnia, uh, PCO2 more than 45 mm of Hg, uh, it uh, this uh, denotes the uh, poor ventilation of the lungs and uh, it is a higher major risk factor for these patients. Secondary bacterial and fungal infection, as I have said, uh, in COVID-19 patients, we use a high dose of steroids or uh, long-term steroids or immunosuppressive agents to treat the cytokine storm in, um, in pneumonia, along with prolonged mechanical ventilation. It is a it may lead to severe sepsis. Uh, causing a uh, uh, major risk factor for this patient. Aspergillosis and mucormycosis, these are the fun common fungal infections in uh, common fungal infection in these patients. It is common in diabetic <coughs> and immunosuppressor uh, suppressed COVID-19 patient. So these are the factors that uh, determine the survival 
or the mortality in the uh, prolonged prolongedly ventilated covid 19 patients this uh, is most of the deaths in ventilated covid 19 patients are due to refractory hypoxemia or multi organ failure and refractory hypoxemia is treated in some centers with ecmo and some of these patients develop progressive fibrotic lung disease with poor prognosis these patients may go for lung transplant thank you Good evening, respected uh, CCA founders, Dr. Krishna sir, Dr. Narendra Pradeepa sir, Dr. Narendra sir, and Dr. Ravi Dosi sir, my moderator, Dr. Vijay sir, and the co-panelists, CCA family, very good evening, welcome to this webinar. Today's topic of uh, discussion is management of prolonged ventilation in COVID patients. My topic of discussion today is when to consider ECMO in COVID-19 patients. This is the general schema for respiratory support in patients with COVID-19 patients. Many patients, they are developing their respiratory failure due to COVID pneumonia and the uh, post-COVID fibrosis and COVID ARDS. So usually the management is symptomatic in supportive treatment. To start the supportive treatment in the case of mild to moderate respiratory failure, we use the low flow oxygen and the patient is not able to maintain means to go for high flow nasal cannula, HFNC, HFNO. Despite HFNO, patient is not able to maintain the saturation. We have to go for the NIV, non-invasive ventilation, either CPAP or BiPAP. The BiPAP indications are high flow respiratory failure to COPD and COVID pneumonia. Despite the NIV, patient is uh, showing no improvement. Patient is uh, hemodynamically unstable. Then we have to think in terms of Invasive mechanical ventilation, we have to follow the uh, lung protective ventilatory strategy. Majority of the patients, they recovered well with these supportive measures. Some of the patients, 5 to 10 percent of patients, may require uh, other kind of ventilation. The prone ventilation, we usually put the patient on prone position from moderate cases to severe cases, and even after the NAV, we can put the patient on prone position. Despite all the support, patient is not improving. So we have to think in terms of ECMO extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, mainly the veno-venous ECMO. The indications remains unclear. Early discussion with the ECMO center and the ECMO team may be advisable to support the patient. ELSO guidelines. This is the recent recommendation. ELSO, extracorporeal oxygen. There is extracorporeal life support organization guideline. The indications of ECMO are very clear. Any of the one. PaO2 bar FaO2 ratio less than 60 millimeter of mercury for six hours. PaO2 FaO2 ratio less than 50 millimeter of mercury for more than three hours. pH less than 7.2 plus PaCO2 more than 80 millimeter of mercury for more than six hours. If yes, provided that there is no contraindication. Contraindications mainly recent cardiac arrest or prolonged ventilations. And these are the poor uh, no uh, patients recover from ECMO. May not recover from ECMO. So we have to, uh, to see the contraindications and put the patient on ECMO. So this is the indications as per the ELSO guideline. What is ECMO? ECMO is a form of extracorporeal life support where an external orifical circuit carries venous blood from the patient to a gas exchange device called oxygenator, where blood becomes enriched with oxygen and has carbon dioxide removed. The blood is then return to the patient via a central vein or on artery. What is the principle behind the ECMO machine? Desaturated blood is drained via a venous cannula. CO2 is removed, oxygen added through an extracorporeal device. The blood is then returned to systemic circulation via another vein. That is veno-venous ECMO or artery veno-arterial ECMO. This is the ECMO basic principles. Blood low in oxygen close to ECMO machine in ECMO machine, oxygenates the blood, blood containing oxygen is returned to the body. ECMO serves as a bridge therapy and not a curative therapy. Used as a bridge to recovery, that is, buying time for patient to recover, bridge to decision, provide temporary support to patient and allow clinician to decide on the next step. Bridge to transplant, provide support to patient while awaiting suitable 
donor organ. Contraindications to ECMO are there are no absolute contraindications. Relative contraindications due to poor outcome are mechanical ventilation at high settings, that is, FAO2 more than 90%, that to person more than 30 for seven days or more. Major pharmacological immunosuppression. CNS hemorrhage, which is uh, recent or expanding. Non recoverable comorbidities such as major CNS damage or terminal malignancy or recent cardiac arrest. Age, no specific age contraindication, but increasing risk with age. Complications of ECMO. These are the common complications we come across. Because ECMO, there is a flow based on uh, the flow depends on the how much anticoagulation we are giving. So to maintain the circulation flow, so we need to have the proper anticoagulation. If any mismatch or any underdose or overdose, so we met with complications like bleeding is one of the common complications. Cerebral bleed is one of the commonest complications we come across. And trauma embolism, cannulation related. Sometimes the cannulation site, the vessel tear happens and hit uh, happen into thrombocytopenia. These are the common complications of the ECMO. Weaning or off ECMO, like ventilator weaning, so we have an ECMO weaning or off ECMO based on the radiographic clearance and oxygen level, vitals like a pulse, BP, heart rate, and respiratory rate, and blood parameters like fatal count, bleeding time, clotting time, and other coagulation profile, we would check periodically. So seeing the uh, patient on uh, while on ECMO treatment, so these are all the parameters we are looking, whether the patient is improving or worsening, or we have to change the you know, uh, treatment modalities we have to see. So this is the basic of the uh, you know, basic parameters before the beginning or of ECMO. This is the pictorial diagram showing the ECMO cannula, the deoxygenator or unoxygenated blood draws into the pump. The uh, blood goes to the oxygen oxygenator. The oxygenated blood again goes to the system. This is the extracorporeal mission, ECMO mission. You can see like the artificial, this is a dilation mission. This is a lung dialysis or artificial lung mission. You can see here, tubing correct to the patient, blood gas monitor, pressure monitoring, water heater, ECMO pump, artificial lung, and backup battery. ECMO system, again, there is a blue color indicates there is a venous blood or unoxygenated blood goes to the pump, from the pump to the membrane oxygenator, there the oxygen is added and CMOS is removed. This blood goes to the system again. And the uh, there are two types of ECMO commonly uh, commonly availability. One is the venous ECMO. The main indications are severe respiratory failure or ARDS, and the venous ECMO mainly for the cardiac insufficiency, cardiac patients, myocarditis. We have to use the venous ECMO. This is the ECMO cannula. You can see the femoral artery cannulation site from the ECMO. There are uh, multiple site cannulations and uh, double site cannulations are available. To conclude, when to consider ECMO in COVID patients? Mainly based on the PF ratio, that is a uh, partial pressure of oxygen and FAO2 ratio is less than 60 and not improving even after proning. The PCO2 retention causing pH less than 7.1 even after maximum ventilator settings. Veno venous ECMO mainly indicated in the case of uh, ARDS, COVID ARDS and post COVID lung fibrosis causing severe respiratory failure. Veno venous ECMO is one of the indications. Veno arterial ECMO is the indications for any cardiac associated uh, malformation. Mobile ECMO mainly to retrain the patient from non ECMO center to ECMO center. So, the conclude my talk ECMO is one of the bridge treatment to recovery and bridge treatment to uh, transplant. So, to conclude my talk, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. N.H. Krishna, sir, Dr. Ravidosai, sir, and Dr. Vijay Kumar, sir, for giving me this opportunity to uh, address you all in this uh, esteemed uh, event. Now, the topic that is given to me is how to design effective weaning in COVID patients. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to discuss on this topic. Uh, so what is weaning? Weaning is the process of decreasing the degree of uh, ventilatory support and allowing the patient to assume a greater proportion of their own ventilation, whether spontaneous ventilation or gradual reduction in the ventilator support. And the weaning is said to be a successful weaning 
if there is absence of ventilator support for about 48 hours after doing extubation. Now there are four steps of doing ventilation in COVID-19 patients. So the first step is to have a suspicion that is the patient has now recovered from the acute respiratory failure, failure and he is ready to win. That is the first step. After that, the step, second step is to see the readiness of uh, weaning, whether he is ready to wean from the ventilator. So for that, we have the objective criteria and this, the readiness to wean criteria for COVID-19 patients is to look for the satisfactory oxygenation. If the saturation is normal, if the PaO2 by FaO2 is more than 200 with a peep of less than or equal to 5 centimeters of water, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, that is, there is no need of any continuous vasopressor infusion. If the consciousness is normal, patient is awake and easily aroused, and the cough and the secretion management is adequate, that is, the patient is able to cough effectively uh, as roughly assessed by the presence of coughing in response to any uh, endotracheal uh, suctioning or aspiration. And uh, uh, the respiratory physiological criteria, that is, rapid shallow breathing index of less than 100 after two minutes of a spontaneous breathing trial. The third step in weaning of COVID-19 patients is the spontaneous breath prayer. And once the readiness to wean has been confirmed in presence of the criteria mentioned above, SBT should be conducted. And SBT is needed to confirm the patient's ability to breathe without any assistance. So how to perform a spontaneous breath trial in a COVID-19 patient? So regularly when we do spontaneous breath trial, we use a TPS trial. But in case of the COVID-19 patients, we should not use any TPS trial because of lot of aerosolization that is seen in these patients. And we should use a closed loop method. That is, we can use a normal uh, closed system. And when you are using a closed system, the chances are that they, it may go on for more time. That is, we should uh, use SBT for up to two to four hours, preferably 120 minutes in COVID patients, especially in uh, those patients who are having COPD, underlying heart failure and neuromuscular disorders. Then the criteria for assessing the successfulness of the spontaneous breath trial in COVID-19 patients is the following. That is, if the respiratory rate is less than 35 breaths per minute, if the patient is tolerating spontaneous breath trial in a well way, in a good way, the heart rate is less than 140 per minute and heart rate variability is more than 20%. And uh, if the saturations are more than 90% or uh, PO2 is more than 60 mmHg with an FAO2 of less than 0.4, and the systolic blood pressure is more than 80 and less than 180 mmHg with less than 20% change from the baseline. And when there are no signs of increased work of breathing or distress. And the criteria for the failure of the spontaneous breath trial in COVID-19 patient is when we assess the presence of diaphoresis, when there is a lot of nasal flaring, if the patient is getting cyanosis, if there is tachypnea, there is an abdominal paradox is present, there is a lot of sternocleidomastoid activity, suprasternal and supraclavicular recession is seen, if there is intercostal recession is seen and there is a lot of tachycardia and in the monitor if we see cardiac arrhythmias and uh, hypotension and the patient is becoming apneic, uh, that means it is the uh, clinical criteria of the failure of the spontaneous breath trial. And the gas exchange criteria for the failure of the spontaneous breath trial is increase in the PTCO2 of more than 10 mmHg, decrease in the arterial pH of less than 7.32, decline in arterial pH of more than 0.07. PSCO2 of less than 60 mmHg with an FAO2 of more than 0 0.40 and a fall in SPO2 of more than 5% is considered to be the failure of the SVT. And the fourth and the final step is the actual extubation. So the COVID specific modification, when we compare the COVID-19 patients with the normal patients, we have to add certain things. The most important thing is because this suctioning and the suctioning of the endotracheal tube and the extubation procedure, these are aerosol generizing procedures. So we have to maintain a closed loop system, which is a non-aerosol generating procedure. So this is the dual limb circuit that we have to use in order to prevent any leak of the air outside. And the other COVID specific modification is that we have to use a higher degree of readiness for extubation in patients with COVID-19, including higher criteria for passing a spontaneous breath trial. And use a lower pressure support ventilation that is 0 to 5 centimeters of water. And we should use it for a longer period. That is, we have to check for more time rather than for uh, half an hour. We have to use for two to four hours. And if we, whether to use cuff leak test in COVID-19 patients or not. It is always better not to use a couple of tests because it is associated with a lot of aerosolization. 
But when we are we having suspicion for upper airway edema, when there is a fluid overload is present, and when the patient is at risk of post extubation skydive, then we have to check for the cuff leak test. So during the extubation procedure, what we have to do? So we have to do the extubation in an airborne isolation room. Not many people should be present. At least only two people should be present, and they should be in a close communication with the clinician who is experienced in an extubation. And the, both the people should wear the complete uh, PPE, N95 mask, and IA protection or equivalent to that. And it is better in order to prevent the uh, cough, we should use pre-medication prior to extubation. The antitussives like giving lidocaine via endotechal tube can be used or a low-dose opiate bolus like dexamethamine or ramifentanil can also be used. So during the extubation, we should use the following things. That is, drape the patient's chest and face with a plastic cover so as to provide a barrier protection between the patient and the operator. And they set the ventilator in a standby mode, switch off mode. And after balloon deflation, extra care should be given taken during endotracheal tube removal to keep the inline suctioning catheter engaged during the cuff deflation. And another handle suction catheter should be also be available for removal of pharyngeal and oral secretions. So the endotracheal tube should be removed as smoothly as is feasible during inspiration and immediately disposed of into a biohazard plastic bag bundled together with the ventilator tubing, the plastic drape, tape, endotracheal tube holders and inline suction catheter and then the bag is sealed and disposed of immediately. And the post extubation care we should be ready with low flow and high flow oxygen systems which should be set up and readily available for post extubation oxygenation. We should also be ready with the HFNO and NIV which can be used as a uh, bridging therapy if the patient is immediately desaturating in there. And uh, suctioning should always done with a closer inline suctioning catheter. So, how to predict reintubation? It is very common in COVID 19 patients to get reintubated after extubation. And we have to use the predictors for the reintubation, and we should assess that these patients may go into reintubation. So, the predictors are the older age group people, the patient who are having associated CVA, paralytics, and the need for high, the patients are needing higher amount of PEEP prior to extubation. And if the patients are needing greater respiratory support following extubation, and if there is a non-pulmonary organ failure which is uh, present, which is uh, it, we should predict uh, the intubation. So the specific ventilator strategies which we can uh, use in this COVID-19 patients who are intubated for an effective weaning are we can we have to use a higher flat tube. Uh, we should see that the higher flat tube pressures are not present. We should always assess the and calculate the flat tube pressure in the ventilator and see that. It is in a lower level because the flat tube pressure is a independent risk factors for the failure of the weaning. And a higher compliance and lower driving pressure are good protective factors for the uh, weaning. And the protective ventilation is very important for which we should use a tidal volume of less than 8 ml per kg and a flat tube pressure goal of less than 30 centimeters of water. So lower tidal volume and flat tube pressures are all, and also the lower driving pressures are associated with the lower mortality rate and the less chance of weaning failure. And the proning should be followed for all the patients who are having PIO2 by FIO2 ratio of less than 50 mm HC. Then the fluid management should be taken care of and we should restrict the fluid management as much as possible. That is, we should avoid fluids. So wherever possible, avoid maintenance high fluids avoid high volume enteral nutrition, avoid fluid bolses. So then there are a set of COVID-19 patients. Most commonly we see there is difficulty in weaning the COVID-19 patients. So most of, uh, sometimes after the first spontaneous breath trial, the patient may be extubated. But sometimes what happens is uh, the patient uh, fails the weaning test and uh, automatically he will be assigned to a group that is difficult to wean group. And the most common causes of failing a spontaneous breath trial are incomplete resolution, of the underlying critical illness, errors in assessing the readiness to be in, and presence of a new problem. So then we have to sort out various etiologies which might be causing the difficulty in weaning in these COVID-19 patients. The first and foremost is the respiratory ventilator problem itself. So there may be increased ventilatory demand, uh, which may be the cause to, for this, which may be due to, again, due to hypoxemia and the elevated dead space, or because of excess carbon dioxide production, which may be due to fever, infection, or overfeeding. And metabolic acidosis, if it is present, may also cause an increase in the ventilator demand. And neuropsychiatric factors like delirium, anxiety, pain should also be looked into. And sometimes increasing with assistive load, like bronchoconstriction, which may be because of underlying COPD, asthma, in addition to COVID-19, 
or airway edema because of lower respiratory infection or secretions within the trachea, that is trachea bronchitis, pneumonia and other equipment issues should also be looked into. Then the cause may be the increased elastic load, which may be causing the weaning failure. Then we have to look for the dynamic hyperinflation, like the COPD underlying the COPD asthma or alveolar filling, which may be due to pulmonary edema or atelectasis. And the underlying pleural disease also, we should look after. That is, if there is any pleural effusion, any pneumothorax or chest wall disease, we should also look into the abdominal distension, that is morbid obesity, ileus or ascites. Then the reduced neuromuscular capacity of the patient can also be the cause for weaning failure, in which case we should look into the electrolyte abnormalities like hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia. And some medications uh, which the patient is uh, using, like most of the COVID patients are on steroids, and the ventilator patients are neuromuscular blocking agents. They may cause weaning difficulty. And the patient may be on malnutrition, <coughs> patient may be a hypothyroid patient with uh, uh, abnormal thyroid values, or maybe in patient in is in septic shock, or maybe neuropathy may be present, like Gulenberry syndrome or critical illness polyneuropathy or myopathy, which may be causative factor for the difficult to weaning this COVID-19 patients. Then we should also look into the decreased ventilatory drive process, like usage of excessive sedation or the presence of metabolic alkalosis, which may be in turn because of nasogastric suction or because of volume depletion or usage of diuretics or other causes which are causing a chloride depletion. And the also CNS diseases like stroke and encephalopathy are associated along with the COVID-19 disease. They may also cause a decrease in the ventilatory drive. And sometimes the patient may be obese, resulting in the obesity hypoventilation syndrome or central sleep apnea may be present. So we have to investigate these patients with the proper clinical and neurological examination, doing chest X-ray, ABG and protein chemistries, thyroid function test to rule out the hypothyroidism, nutritional assessment for malnutrition, occasional chest CT and abdominal and the CT angiography, and narrow conduction studies to see the neurological abnormalities and also bronchoscopy where it is required. So we have to also treat the underlying cause. If there is underlying etiology, is bronchospasm. We have to give bronchodilators, adequate antibiotics, uh, regular pulmonary toileting in the fluids if there is septic shock and diuresis if there is fluid overload and administer the oxygen as and when required and adjust the mechanical ventilator settings and if there is any autopic we should correct it and we should also correct the feeding and metabolic disturbances and optimize the sedative analgesia here if required. And we should also look for any tube block, ED tube block in which case we have to chase the endotracheal tube. And we have to do the physical physical therapy and thoracentesis if there is any pleural effusion. We should also look for the cardiac causes for the difficulty in weaning COVID-19 patients. So we have to do a multi-lead ECG to rule out any myocardial ischemia. If there is any pulmonary edema suspected, we should look for the pro-BNP and transferrasic echocardiography should be done in order to look for any cardiac abnormality. And if there is any fluid load is present, we should assess the fluid load over. And in these cases, before doing a spontaneous breath trial, we should make sure that we will maximize the cardiac medication. So we have to do a give appropriate dosage of beta blockers, diuretics, AC inhibitors, and vasodilators before giving a spontaneous breath trial. And we should also look into the psychological causes for difficulty in weaning COVID-19 patients. So the psychological issues like depression, anxiety, delirium, pain that the patient is suffering from may cause the difficulty to win. And over sedation may also cause the limiting the ventilation and impede the cooperation with the spontaneous breath trial. So we have to clinically examine the patient and assess the pain and manage the pain uh, effectively. So we have to educate the patient if the patient is in depression and anxiety and we have to optimize the sedatives and analgesic medications if the patient is having any pain. And the cause may be the ventilator circuit. If there is any ventilator circuit abnormality, that may cause the equipment dead space, that may increase the uh, abnormality, that may cause the circuit compliance to vary, and uh, that may cause the gas compression volume, exhalation valve dysfunction may be there, and there may be increased resistance because of the endotracheal tube narrowing due to the increased secretions which cause the tube block. So we have to examine the ventilator waveforms. We should look into any ventilator asynchrony. If there is any increase in the peak inspiratory pressure, increase in the plateau pressure, then we can assess that there is maybe there may be any block in the ET tube. In that case, we have to change the ET tube, the endotracheal tube, or do a pulmonary toilet. Then the other etiologies are nutritional deficiencies. So if the patient is in a prolonged mechanical ventilation for a lot of um, prolonged time, that means for more than 15 or 20 days, then there may be underlying protein catabolism. And in those cases, they do, this results in the respiratory muscle weakness. Uh, and in the addition to that, there may also be overfitting. 
which leads to increased carbon dioxide production and increased ventilatory load. So we have to uh, calculate the nutritional needs of the patient and we have to give administer adequate nutrition for that patient. So I thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you very much. Superb job, uh, my dear friends. Jay, you did fantastic, and uh, Virender, and then Praveen. Okay, it's uh, in fact, you know, one of the very tough tasks that uh, uh, Krishna and team have given to us, but brilliant talks by all three of you. And uh, to set the ball rolling, um, there are a few questions. Uh, here in the chat box, let me ask one by one. Jay, uh, uh, I have gone, I have listened to the lecture, you know, uh, very detailed, but was uh, uh, you haven't covered the cost of uh, ECMO initiation and running a program. So, uh, can you please enlighten our people regarding cost of care for ECMO? Yes, Vijay. Thank you. Good evening, CCA, for this opportunity. So, the cost of ECMO per day, approximately it will cost around, including disposables, the stay and the ICU staff, everything, it will come to around 1.5 to 2.5 lakhs approximately per day. 1.5 to 2.5 per day, it will cost to run the ECMO daily. Because the disposables, pumps, each and everything, blood products, <coughs> this is a package around 1.5 to 2.5 lakhs per day for uh, the you know uh, ECMO run duration. So this approximately per day charges, it may cover uh, you know, one week, two weeks, three weeks, depends upon the patient improvement and the comorbid conditions and the you know, improvement rate. So per day cost itself, so 2.5 lakhs will come. Yes, sir. Right. And uh, what is the, naturally the next question is, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, it cost pocket very hugely. So, what is the roughly <coughs> success rate? Success by definition, probably you know, uh, successfully weaning off from ECMO and then subsequently weaning off from uh, ventilation as well. Yes, we did. See, ECMO mainly the supportive treatments. So, once the ventilator parameters, everything is you no know, uh, full fledged ventilation, prone position. We try all the measures. The pH is uh, no, severe respiratory acidosis, here these pictures, face is not improving. So we give the one of the life support system as per the ELSO guidelines, extracorporeal life support uh, organization guidelines, very clearly mentioned. If it's pH is low, severe respiratory acidosis cases. So we have to starting on EPO, ECMO. This is one of the supportive life support. Life support, patient slowly it will improve. See, there are a lot of complications to may come across with the patients. So without any complications, in our center, you know, there are, there are variations from one center to another center. There is uh, no, the uh, response rate. In our center, 35 to 40 percent, they improve nicely without any complications. So nicely, we can give from ventilator, 35 to 40 percent of patients. And the remaining 15 to 20 percent of patients may end up with a lung transplantation. And 25 to 30 percent of patients may succumb to the disease because of the this is induced or some hydrogenic, what we are giving, anticoagulation, bleeding complication, infections, a lot of things. So, as a rough idea, so we are not going to know uh, the, uh, the publish our paper from our uh, experience of India. The ECMO, the survival rate is approximately 40% people. So, they come out within uh, you know, uh, maximum, the uh, ECMO run duration is uh, uh, 10 days to 14 days. So, two weeks period, maximum three weeks period, they will come out. If it is more than three weeks, so we have to put the patient on lung transplant list and the you know maximum uh, four weeks to six weeks, eight weeks on ECMO, then once the uh, donor lung is available, so we can uh, know, get the... Uh, we will come to that a little later. So, uh, let me uh, ask Virendra Bhai. Virendra Bhai, a whole ton of appreciations for your talk. That was the most lucid talk I have ever had 
whereas you have simplified uh, really very uh, well so out of so many things in your experience as a senior uh, pulmonologist and then uh, intensivist what are the factors that you look in your cases to decide yes on the day of intubation we can say that this patient okay on the day of admission into icu this patient may not come may not make it or this patient the chance of yes <laughs> apart from you know regular mild crp or you know mild ct score all those things so what helps you in picking up you know such critical cases early so that we can focus on them on these cases in particular uh, definitely we have seen uh, many uh, factors are there but uh, mainly the elderly patients with major comorbidities like uh, ild post bypass post cab patient post plasty patients or some uh, blood malignancy patient these are very difficult to treat with high score of uh, high ct score markers are definitely uh, arise in these patients but these patients are very difficult to treat at or and they may be uh, at risk uh, they may not come out of uh, this uh, mechanical ventilation may they uh, they may succumb uh, due to these factors but uh, yeah, generally it is a post cabg post bypass patient diabetic patients elderly patient this uh, this is the group that is very difficult to treat and uh, sometime we may know that this patient may not come there is out. there is one saying okay a general in the public nephrologists after covid they are starting their practice afresh because some group of people they comment all the ckd patients are whitewashed with covid what is your take on this do you also agree <laughs> ckd i don't agree whatever patients i have seen in our setup uh, uh, in our setup but ckd patient uh, they do well uh, if we do a regular uh, hemodialysis as per their uh, alternate day or uh, twice a week thrice a week this patient survived i don't think so right okay but uh, here we have seen you know good amount of mortality as you rightly mentioned those patients who have cardiac comorbids elderly age uncontrolled you know uh, comorbid conditions so and uh, probably you know uh, in my experience okay good amount of ckd patients they have uh, succumb to virus particularly when in the first wave and second wave of course thank god third day uh, almost uh, entire uh, india got oma uh, affected with uh, omicron so that's uh, probably 3% 4% delta strain still persists but because thanks to omicron um, the outcomes are much much better in the third wave and uh, thank you virender for the clarification pravi so uh, very uh, tough task to cover in 14 minutes pravi really you did a fantastic job uh so for you yes the moment the patient is there in classical setting for any pneumonia or for any for any other sepsis septic shock we uh, have our own uh, weaning protocols we definitely you know uh, follow such guidelines but in your experience on as per evidence both early extubation followed by nib is it beneficial or standard delayed extubation to face mask which one do you prefer in your practice in my experience uh, many cases uh, we have seen that after the patient uh, is improving yeah. for 3 to 4 days he is ready for weaning we tend to feel that he is going to improve so if in such cases if we keep nav they will improve rapidly there are chances that they improve rapidly especially this has been proven correct in cases of copd patients who have improved in the first 3 days we have seen that after extubating and keeping nav they are coming out very rapidly this also helps in same thing same way similarly it also helps in case of covid patients where uh, we have observed that after extubation early extubation 
when uh, otherwise in normal pneumonia cases we have we would have waited but in covid patients when we extubate early and we keep nav we are reducing the complications of the in invasive mechanical ventilations uh, and we are able to reduce the sedation and we are able to uh, <coughs> get him out of the icu and so that the length of stay overall is also reduced thereby it is very helpful in using niv before keeping the oxygen so you are extrapolating the data from copd or uh, how we ventilate uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema patients the moment you uh, see a degree of stability keep a low threshold and extubate them to niv that's what you say right correct yes correct. thank you thanks for the clarity and uh, uh j what are the basic monitoring parameters that you keep when a patient is on ecmo and please enlighten us that how do i understand that my patient is getting better on ecmo yeah once we put on the patient on ecmo extracorporeal membrane no oxygenation so the there are three phases one is the you no know, to start with uh, you no know, all the tubing connections with the anticoagulation blood flow and the rotation per minute and the sweep rate flow rate everything we assess then we assess by monitoring and by doing the abg arterial blood gas daily and the blood parameters like aptt activated pulse thermoplasty time to see any you know um, drug induced mainly the anticoagulation induced complications and other parameters like the count and the blood parameters like your total count whether the patient developing any infections apart from these and daily we must take the radiography chest diagram to see any first clearance or not whether the patient is responding with our medications or not so there are meticulous way of uh, doing the daily battery of test we do to prevent complications and to find out the early complications to pick up the uh, you know, any fault very easily so mainly the radiographic clearance if it is a radiograph clearance is there day by day so patient is improving and the abc criteria po to fo ratio is coming down fo2 start with the 90% then slowly come down to 60 40 and normal 21% with the vitals mainly the pulse and bp at the temperature everything is normal so this way we can assess daily day to day basis with the, with the battery of test and monitoring the patient and seeing the patients and the adjustment of the flow and the protection permit in the ecmo ecmo machine and the sweep rate so this way we meticulously monitor the patients daily with a no complete assessment so we know that patient yeah this patient is improving with the ecmo so responding very well so one week maximum 10 days we can completely wean from ecmo and study more no ventilations so slowly we can do all the things and with the ecmo also we can police the patients in the no the ecmo department in the room further we can be able to no make the patient mobilized with that pulmonary rehabilitation teams so this way we monitor the patients while on ecmo treatment yes today so yes sir pulmonary <laughs> rehabilitation will also be uh, play key role in these patients you mean to yes, say yes a very important role pulmonary rehabilitation plays a major role we have dedicated team of uh, no headed by the cardiothoracic surgeons and the cardiothoracic anesthesiologists perfusionists cardiologists pulmonologists and the you no know, perfusionists and the technical team there are uh, 100 team members meticulously monitor all the things with the physiotherapies and the pulmonary rehabilitation plays a major role in the uh, recuperating the patients so the this way we manage daily and see so every uh, you know uh, person to take care of individual work to particularly assess the you know ecmo patients so we have to have the you know achieve the success rate to so pulling back the back the patient to the normality so this way we can proceed and majority of the patients they do well and unexpectedly some of the patients they may do the complication yeah thank you jay um uh, here there is a uh, suggestion that you need to give jay how do we train ourselves in ecmo by dr ashish sinha from bihar thank you uh, ashish for that uh, wonderful question because this question is going to help hundreds of other pulmonologists please right. see we have a ecmo training program in our center mgm and we have a fellowship program in transplant pulmonology in mgm healthcare chennai so we do a training program so every year we have two seats for the 
pulmonology is to practice to train there is a fellowship course is there once you enroll in a transplant pulmonology we have a transplant and ecmo all part and parcel of this uh, you no know, work camp so last two months before itself we had a chennai cc conference the same day sunday there is a full workshop is uh, you no know, uh went ahead in our hospital a two days program and uh, exclusively for the pulmonologist uh, uh, two to five three hours so we made it in our center for our uh, cc conference people so like this every year we have the ecmo conference all in the ecmo level conference just two months back when mgm conducted the second national ecmo conference so training program for the pulmonologist and the cardiac surgeons and cardiac anesthesiologists and all the all the people For pulmonology, we train means there is separate uh, two years course of fellowship in uh, transplant pulmonology. There we do all ECMO and the transplant. Every program is there in our center. Yes. Sir. I think Vijay, can you hear me, voice? Yes, I think Doctor Vijay is not there. Okay. Yeah, ah, Vijay is gone. Yeah. Yes, Vijay. Vijay. Uh, thank you uh, for that uh, input, uh, Doctor J. In the sense, uh, okay, what I was suggesting, uh, Ashish is, I'm a CCM member first. and uh, we will give you the and then so can he uh, he can get into any program with his <laughs> so uh, ashish hope that uh, clarifies your uh, question <clears throat> coming to uh, pravin are you there yes i am there the uh, Doctor Satya G. Tayade from Mumbai, Maharashtra. What is the role of high dose of vitamin C, whether it is useful in severe COVID disease or not? Your inputs. Yes, sir. So vitamin C, we have seen injections of vitamin C have been uh, given uh, during the second uh, wave as well as in the first wave. and uh, there are also in normal air days also we have seen that uh, uh, vitamin c has some role there are many papers suggesting the role of the vitamin c and vitamin c can be given it will improve the immunity and uh, thereby it can reduce the infection load present in the lungs but uh, actually when we see the patients in the covid 19 patients there is not, not much of evidence of the vitamin c uh, completely like uh, when we see on the patients on uh, ventilators and uh, as a personal experience when i have seen the vitamin c all the we are keeping that uh, it is uh, just an add on therapy uh, rather than the sole uh, thing that can improve the condition of the patient i i But don't know evidence to prevent because uh, so uh, enough uh, uh, evidence or robust evidence is lacking for management of ards with vitamin c Yes, there are few papers which have been published which says high dose uh, vitamin C to the tune of 15 gram per day. Okay, can cause a, probably a slight uh, advantage when compared to standard therapy. But for management of ARDS, the uh, sine qua non, the golden rule is always okay. If needed intubation, early intubation. and if uh, uh, if you are ventilating low tidal volume strategy and uh, uh, if the fao to requirements are high manage with high peep okay at the earliest whenever there is a need to recruitment to gently and be aggressive and then uh, if you want to uh, prone early proning is always very very crucial in these patients don't delay um uh, uh proning as a few days later but another very important concept this brings to me one important concept here here is i was listening to uh, virendra stop what he mentioned is one of the key factor in predicting a um, lot of complications is nbd failure yes virendra please throw some light on okay when do you call it as an nbd failure and uh, what are the factors 
that determine the outcomes when the patient is moving from NIV to ventilation? Definitely, whenever we admit a patient in ICU, initially if patient is conscious, uh, patient don't have other comorbidities like uh, severe COPD or no hypercapnia on ABG, we always try to give him uh, NIV support. But we should know with uh, serial ABGs and his uh, respiratory rate and other factors, when we should go for a mechanical ventilation. Any uh, any time we are consuming more on NIV support, patient is definitely going to deteriorate further. So early intubation and early mechanical, mechanical ventilation is always better. Many times we try to avoid mechanical ventilation or we try to give more uh, uh, trial with NIV support. In this patient, this patient then go into a um, crash ventilation, crash intubation and this patient deteriorate further. So we should know the point at what point we should go for uh, uh, mechanical intubation and mechanical ventilation. So how we can decide? We can decide with what is the uh, which serial ABG is, what is the hypoxia, hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis, whether patient is going into fatigue and uh, retaining the carbon dioxide, uh, patient's age, other comorbidities. So early the uh, intubation, if patient needs, it should be done early so that patient do doesn't go in fatigue or don't uh, go into crash intubation. That is the point what I have said. Uh, here, here I am also seeing uh, one of the very wonderful paper which uh, uh, has been published in Annals of Intensive Care, which clearly mentioned, and uh, this was... Uh, uh, published somewhere in uh, 2021, which clearly mentioned if you give a try on NIV, do not wait for more than two days. If the patient is improving in 48 hours, then then patient might get benefited with continuation of NIV. If patient is not in, uh, improving or if the patient is even static on NIV, that means you're giving 100% uh, uh, FAO2 on NAV with the um, high, high, peep, high driving pressure support. Despite that, patient tachypnea persists. Patient, you cannot uh, take off even few minutes NAV to feed him or uh, 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 to give other care. So those are the cases where they will cra crash at any moment and then uh, always in COVID, elective intubation is very, very safe when compared to crash intubation. Thank you, Virendra, for that brilliant input. And uh, here brings, okay, to all the uh, three panelists, one of the commonest problem what we face encounter in our COVID pneumonia patients. When to consider or what are the various things? I asked this question first to Dr. J. Jeraman. So, when to consider steroids in COVID patients, COVID pneumonia? Yes, we have enough evidence uh, with uh, a recovery trial and uh, uh, where dexamethasone has played a very crucial role in recovery. And we have uh, evidences like remap cap trial. We have codex trial that is uh, COVID-19, uh, dexamethasone in COVID-19 trial. Okay, and uh, there was uh, WHO REACT trial. So many trials have published there is a role to methylprednisolone or dexamethasone in management of COVID-19 pneumonia patients. Okay, yes. Uh, before uh, handovering to you, I also say when there is no gross hypoxia, do not administer steroids in first one week because that's the time where the patients might land in more profuse viremia and then more uh, progression of the disease, we may be facilitating uh, you know, a deterioration of the patient, particularly if we give in first five to six days of the illness. Over to Jay Raman. Yeah. The role of steroids, as per the recovery trial clearly mentioned, so when to give steroids in the case of COVID pneumonia? So very clear cut. There are three, four phases of COVID infection, COVID-19. First phase is the viremia phase or infective phase. In that infective phase, there are the virus multiplication, the replication. So during the time, so we should not give the steroid in the first phase or the infective phase. If the patient is uh, no, pass on to the second phase called the inflammatory phase, 
or the patient started developing persistent fever during 8th 9th or 10th day or persistent cough or persistent disturbed sleep because of the breathlessness or the saturation tendency to drop less than 95 or 92 that is the time we have to start the uh, dosage of uh, dexamethasone 8 mg uh, once daily for 5 to 10 days or we can start the injection uh, solimedrol 40 mg tds depends upon the guideline recommendations so mainly during the 8th 9th 10th 11th day these five days are very crucial for everyone so if we don't start the crrs in 8 9 10 11 12 days if the patient persistent fever or the oxygen level is dropping 92 90 88 then we miss the bus so these five days are very meticulous period during the inflammatory phase second phase if we have to start the crrs as per the recommendation of the recovery trial patient will improve dramatically provided that we have to give other support methods also like a prone position and a nebulization buricard the inhaled crr plays a major role budisonide budisonide three times we have to give like a inhalation medications so this way we can manage easily apart from oral steroids and the inhalation steroids will help in cut down the you know prevention of uh, you no know, immune storm that is uh, other cases we can uh, 90% of the patients we can cut down by uh, giving the timely intervention by steroid medications in inhale as well as the oral corticosteroids yes virender what is your take yes virender bhai what is your take on you know steroids Steroid. what are the various yes. times that you may end up in giving yes definitely in what uh, jay sir has said definitely whenever we are in viral phase first seven days uh, we should not use the steroids whenever it is the inflammatory phase after eight day uh definitely there is a role of steroids and in some patients it depends on what are the markers what is the ct score if ct score is high <coughs> patient is very breathless markers are very high we may have to give a, a higher dose of steroids like 80 mg or 125 mg for first or one or two doses then we can decrease to 40 mg od but definitely role is there but is a, again it is like a a uh, double edged sword if we give more steroids again patient But that brings to me one important uh, uh, statement from you where when to give pulse steroid okay but you have mentioned about you know 125 mg pulsing so but unfortunately no guidelines have came out about the recommendation of pulse steroids whenever we need to give uh, Uh, steroids probably 40 bd of solvent draw or similar equivalent dose is good enough rather than venturing on to um, pulse steroids yes there are case reports good number of case reports yes uh, where the outcome was very good when given uh, pulse steroids but there is no nationalized recommendations please my dear friends whoever listening to this do not venture into pulse steroids that's a maybe one to one case basis ha, that is that, that's what i was saying uh, saying ki it is a case to case whenever patient is very uh, ct score is very high patient is breathless patient's uh, abg is not good and patient's markers are very high so first one or two doses we may give and we have given it and it has uh, done a good job also but right I, so thank you virender uh, praveen can you please you know put any other uh, areas where we can venture uh, try steroids uh, because uh, when managing these ventilated patients definitely will come across a lot of infections okay and uh, when the patients are uh, recovering from infections sometimes steroids may facilitate uh, help in recovery as well i you you thought on you know what are the other clinical indications where you might end up in giving steroids especially when the patient presents to us when the patient is desaturating when the oxygen levels are low uh, definitely we start the steroids but once the patient is intubated and he is very much desaturated we have to also think about the secondary infections and uh, it's always uh, crucial to reduce the dosage of the steroid even if we are giving we should give a little uh, i mean lower dose as uh, per the guidelines we should give dexamethasone of uh, 6 mg od uh, or uh, iv methylprednisolone of 40 mg uh, iv bd so a little lesser uh, dose and when the patient is having uh, prolonged mechanical ventilation and if there is a lot of uh, uh, edema in the tracheal edema and while uh, extubating the patient if we are uh, uh, 
uh, having difficulty because of uh, the stridus uh, thing, I mean, because of blockage, uh, we can uh, give steroid for that. Right. That so, is another indication. So that's another indication where we can try steroids. And uh, another common indication what we practice in our day-to-day routine is when the patient is having secondary septic shock, okay, maybe patient uh, uh, got uh, uh, pseudomonas or acinodobacter as a pneumonia and then landed in septic shock, which is refractory beyond, which is persistent into beyond 24 hours, then we can comfortably add uh, uh, hydrocortisone at a septic shock dose. That's another indication. And other, another thing which, uh, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So some patients classically after, because when we are uh, talking about managing uh, mechanically ventilated patients, okay, no patients, I was uh, going through uh, another paper, the average time of on ventilator, invasive mechanical ventilator for a COVID patient in a tertiary care hospital was 35 days which is not as, you know, as uh, uh, routinely what we manage for, you know, sepsis or septic shock or uh, regular pneumonias, where we, we ventilate for four days, five days, sometimes, you know, one week, 10 days. Okay. But classically, when we look at the literature retrospectively, each ventilated patient of COVID is there in the hospital, okay, having a lot of turbulence in course. Right, they will be undergoing a, uh, at least a two or three secondary infections, either a CRBSI or VAP or something else or bed sore, whatever it is. So, so some or other form of uh, because of infections, their recovery is invariably prolonged, and an average recovery uh, uh, takes at least uh, uh, thirty-five days, it seems, on average. So. Uh, with that, in such scenario, so I have seen post-COVID persistent inflammatory state. That means patient uh, after uh, three weeks, four weeks of you know hospital stay, patient suddenly develop you know uh, develops uh, raised inflammatory markers. So that's another indication where you may need to venture into early steroids to decrease the inflammation, rule out the infection component, rule out other uh, causes of fever like DVT, pulmonary embolism, secondary bacterial pneumonias, secondary fungal infections, all these things you have to rule out and a judiciously and timely administration of steroids uh, during that phase also will help in early recovery of these patients. Any, anyone wants to add any thoughts here? So, uh, to conclude uh, about this steroids, steroids are definitely a double-edged sword. Judicious usage of steroids is very, very crucial in management of mechanically ventilated patients. The uh, regular indications are, okay, COVID pneumonia with a, uh, moderate to severe hypoxia is an indication. And... Uh, of course, all intubated patients falls into that category, severe category. Definitely, they need steroids. And uh, whenever you find, as Dr. Praveen rightly pointed, uh, when there is a uh, cufflic test positive, and then uh, you uh, you are expecting strider in uh, in extubation. So many patients in our care, what happens is they go on to smooth transition from uh, intubation to tracheostomy, and then only decannulation rather than proper you know, uh, extubation. So, but in case, if there is a chance of early extubation in some patients, if you are suspecting um, that this patient might land in strider, you may consider adding steroids and po persistent post-COVID inflammatory sta uh, state requires steroids and septic shock also uh, demands steroids. And uh, <coughs> um, Dr. Mehta is asking, early use of oral steroids within first seven days is indicated in patients with asthma or COPD or overlap who have cough variant SARS-CoV-2. What is, what are your inputs? So, uh, over to Jairama. Yeah. So, this is one form of uh, infective exacerbation of asthma or infective exacerbation of ILD. In that initial phase, 
So along with the antiviral agent, so we can start the inhalation steroids and oral steroids also. Meticulously, we have to assess any uh, diabetic worsening and other complications. Known asthmatic, developing the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections, worsening of wheezing. So definitely there is a role of steroids. Even in the first phase, there are certain indications in the COPD as the patient. Are, uh, uh, as, you, as you rightly said, probably combined with proper antiviral. Antiviral, exactly. Correct. Or exactly. Under the cover of antiviral. You, under the cover of antiviral, probably we can consider. But again okay. there, please understand when there is, is there a requirement of steroid, oral steroid? No, that, that, that we must always uh, take it into account. If, it, if, if something can be managed with uh, just nebulations or inhalers therapy, that's well and good. But if it demands... Probably, I don't think it uh, uh, steroids are contraindicated in first one week, but if needed, we will add antivirals as well. Virendra, you want to say something? Inhaled steroids you can easily use in these patients. Inhaled, as per stoic study, it is a, a grade one recommendation is there. Stoic study proved beyond doubt. Those patients whom they have initiated on butyrosinate to the tune of 1600 microgram per day, they all have a very good uh, outcome and that was a, one of the very robust study as well yes and uh, coming to uh, virender what are life threatening complications of prolonged ventilation that matters for mortality of these patients uh, definitely whatever in uh, non covid patients also which complications are there in mechanically ventilated patient like one is sepsis septic shock Second is ventilator related uh, complications like barotrauma, what I uh, said, like pneumothorax. Second is VAP, uh, fungal infections, and fungal infections causing another complication. So, first I will say septic shock. Because in this patient, we use uh, steroids, what I have said, and immunosuppression drug for cytokine storms like uh, docilizumab. So, these patients are more prone for sepsis and septic shock. So, this is one of the major complications that may lead to uh, uh, certain, uh, mortality of the patient. Second is, we have to use, uh, these patients have got, uh, some patients have got uh, ARDS, so we use high PEEP. So, using a high PIP may cause a barotrauma. Again, it is a pneumothorax. And in these patients, we generally don't do uh, yeah, ask, uh, yeah, don't do X-rays or something very uh, seriously. So, we may, may uh, we may miss the pneumothorax in these patients, and this is one of the complications. Third is like VAP, uh, what I said, and uh, fungal pneumonia. So, in second wave, we have uh, seen many fungal pneumonias like aspergillosis and mucormycosis. Mucormycosis is very common. So, this is again, it has got a high death rate. And uh, in this uh, mucormycosis patient, we may get a massive hemoptysis that may lead to sudden death. So, these are some of the major complications uh, uh, in these patients, what I think. So, uh, I, I remember you saying uh, uh, aspergillosis is more common in uh, uh, COVID patients. Your, can you please elaborate? After use of uh, uses of steroids in these patients, so many patients who have seen, uh, seen aspergillosis also, uh, who uh, the patients uh, after... Uh, correct, me, correct me if I am wrong. In the same publication uh, I was going through, so, they have randomized in one uh, important study, in COVID patients, they assessed uh, what are the chance of aspergillosis and uh, non-COVID patients like uh, uh, spine flu pneumonias, other viral pneumonias kind of thing. Definitely, there is a chance of having a aspergillosis in COVID patients is high, point number one. Point number two, and uh, uh, they also have seen that the incidence of aspergillosis as a secondary colonizer or secondary pneumonia when uh, patients who have treated with steroids and who have not treated with steroids are also there. So that's why there is some amount of intrinsic uh, susceptibility in COVID lungs where even if you are not managing with steroids, the chance of getting aspergillosis is very high because uh, of various other mechanisms what they have mentioned. But we should notice that, yes, definitely COVID, if you are managing with steroids, watch for aspergillus. That doesn't mean that COVID patients who doesn't, who have not received steroids also, there's a chance of aspergillosis. This is what I want to bring 
bring clarity to the forum. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Virendra Bhai, for that uh, good explanation. And uh, um, coming to uh, Praveen. Uh, yes. Praveen Bhai, what are the ventilator strategies that you use in successful weaning in your COVID patients? Mainly in, uh, 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 in the volume control. Some particular strategy? Yes, uh, the, definitely. Um, the COVID management, as it is similar to the ARDS, we have to start with the low tidal volume strategy, where uh, we will use low tidal volume of 4 to 6 ml per kg body weight. And we should make sure that the plateau pressure should be less than 30 centimeters of water. At the same time, the driving pressure should not be more than 15. It should be less than 15. As there were many papers um, where, we, where it was proved that if the driving pressure is less than 15, the mortality is reduced when compared to the driving pressure more than 15. At the same time, we should also uh, yeah, prefer a higher PEEP and that too depending upon the patient's uh, infection status. That is, if the pneumonia is more, then we can use higher PEEPs, higher PEEP. And we should also restrict the fluid uh, that we give. But the, what, what mode do you suggest when you are attempting weaning? Particularly when we are trying to wean in our patients. So do you recommend a, uh, pressure support mode uh, or uh, do you recommend SAMV or do you recommend APRV? or any any particular thing that you um, suggest? Initially, initially we will try coming to pressure support mode from volume control mode directly to pressure support mode. And if there is any difficulty in doing that, then we can you, we can try APRV. Okay. No, so uh, what I can understand is probably, so um, as we try for other uh, patients, uh, pressure support mode is what uh, probably uh, we can pick as a weaning mode. And then when the patient tolerates a minimum pressure support, say around seven or eight of pressure support and a minimum peep of probably around four or five kind of thing, then with an FAO2, if it touches to close to around 30 or 40, then there is no tachypnea, there is no diaphoresis, there is no, as uh, Praveen rightly pointed out in his presentation, there is no rise in uh, uh, ETCO2, there is no fall in, you know, significant drop in pH, these are the various, you know, uh, important, uh, crucial parameters where we will, okay, depend on um, selecting and then uh, facilitating weaning in our COVID uh, ventilated patients. And um, coming to <coughs> uh, Dr. J, um, what are the various complications that you have encountered at that or? Uh, uh, one must be aware when a patient is on ECMO. The common complication we come across in our uh, you know, center is the mainly the bleeding and infection. So bleeding because of what we are using the anticoagulation, heparin infusion or heparin uh, no, stat dose. So we should cause some, usually we start the you know, low profile anticoagulation to prevent uh, clot formation, to prevent bleeding and all. So despite that, uh, some of the patients, you know, they may develop the bleeding complication, mainly the intra-abdominal and the cerebral bleeding, which may eventually lead to the uh, mortality. Apart from the bleeding, other complications we commonly come across during ECMO, uh, on ECMO support is the infection, the cannulation site infections and uh, other, uh, you know, the site infections which leads to sepsis and other mode of, uh, you know, uh, mortality and thrombosis because of this uh, anticoagulation practices, so some areas we are not giving correct dose. Some areas it will form some uh, clot formation, thrombosis formation, and some other patients they develop some uh, the cannulation site uh, uh, complications like the bleeding from the cannulation site because of the tear in the vessels in the cannulated site, which causes a lot of problem. And rarely we come across the you know uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia hit. hit. So these are the common complications while patient is on ECMO because of mainly the hydrogenic or uh, the disease induced. The COVID itself is uh, no, coagulopathy. It causes uh, no, vasculogenic, it's vasculogenic viruses. It causes a lot of coagulation you know, disturbances. And the, the treatment part, anticoagulation itself, during the ECMO, solution, we need to have a proper anticoagulation. This heparin induced complications like bleeding and the cannulation site uh, no, bleeding and the infections 
thrombosis formation and uh, rarely uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia. These are all the common complications we come across. Usually, bleeding is one of the worst complications because of the bleeding, a lot of patients succumb to this disease because of the cerebral bleed, and we are not able to you know, hold the patient properly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when, when should the tracheas be done in a, in a patient with uh, COVID-19? Praveen? Yes. So tracheostomy can be done either in a, we can do it early tracheostomy, early tracheostomy or late tracheostomy. Early tracheostomy this is, we have to assess depending upon the patient. If we think the patient is improving, he is an improving trend, but we are not able to extubate him, but he will definitely improve. Then we can uh, try tracheostomy. We have to do tracheostomy in between 10th day to 14th day. And if the patient is, we are not sure that he is uh, coming out or not, then we can little bit delay. That depends upon, again, uh, uh, there are pros and cons of doing the tracheostomy. One way, if we are doing, one way, if we are doing tracheostomy, it is a procedure where there is a lot of exposure, where there is a lot of aerosolization of the virus, which may cause infection to the uh, surround, infection to the uh, healthcare workers. At the same time, if we want to try proning, proning is not possible once we do tracheostomy. So these are the two problems that we may encounter. Whereas at the same time, it also helps in reducing the ICU stay because we will be stopping the sedation once we do tracheostomy, thereby helping the patient to uh, improve and wean quickly. Okay. Praveen, so Praveen uh, correct me uh, if I'm wrong. So uh, what we have seen is uh, we have uh, uh, done few cases of you know uh, proning on tracheostomized patients as well. It is, uh, yes, uh, it is not impossible, but some we can try. That's one thing. But having said this, most of the patients, what I, I have seen, uh, I think I'll come to Dr. Jay and Dr. Virender as well. So most of the patients, they are invariably requiring when they got tube, they're invariably, invariably going on to second week, third week, comfortably to fourth week as well on ventilation. So that's why probably tracheostomy, I believe, a early tracheostomy in these patients, as we consider in neurosurgical patients, okay, where, uh, okay, the patient comes with uh, uh, intracranial hemorrhage or something like that, you know, and uh, you know that this patient is going to take really months together and uh, going to spend in neuro recovery for longer, longer duration. Those are the cases where uh, we... Um, uh, tend to tracheostomy as early as fourth day, fifth day kind of thing to reduce the, the chance of ventilator associated pneumonia. Similarly, I think uh, in COVID as well, we must consider uh, this kind of early tracheostomy protocol because almost all intubated patients are going on to third week and fourth week. Jay, your comments, please. Yeah, I fully agree, uh, Dr. Vijay, you were stating that the early tracheostomy and the electric tracheostomy is a very important uh, role in preventing unnecessary uh, infections. <laughs> the early tracheostomy means we have to do meticulously. The five days we have to see the patients in COVID-19 uh, days and all. So the five days, there is no improving trend, definitely after five days, maximum within 10 days. So on average seven days period, patient is not improving or slowly improving. There is a hard status quo. So when we do the tracheostomy to reduce dead space ventilation and easy bronchial toileting, the tracheostomy is one of the golden treatment modality, supportive treatment. So I fully agree with you. This is early and the uh, you know, tracheostomy is very helpful in these type of patients to recover the patients quickly to avoid unnecessary complications like uh, this, uh, the ventilator resistance pneumonia, etc. Et yeah. Oh. Within the view of the Definitely what everyone has said, early tracheostomy is the best policy. Generally, during our practice uh, with our experience, we say this patient may take a longer time on mechanical ventilation. So rather than taking much time, we should uh, do early tracheostomy like what we do in uh, neuro patients. Definitely it will uh, uh, give uh, more chances of survival and uh, lesser uh, complications in these patients. But that's Thank, you. Thank you. Our combined statement is... Uh, do the tracheostomy if at all patient is starts showing you know slight degree of improvement and it is not rapidly recovering so those are the patients catch hold of them probably on day five to day seven get get the tracheostomy and then wean from uh, through tracheostomy that's the best thing 
and uh, this brings me another important very important uh, uh, point uh, to discuss here how because many patients what we see on ventilation they are succumbing to secondary infections like ventilator associated pneumonia just leave about uh, catheter related blood stream infections and then uh, catheter associated utis that's a different story but majority of times either pseudomonas klebsiella or rhinobacter sometimes <laughs> pcp sometimes uh, unusual organisms like burkhold area morganella so on and so forth we have seen a few patients of uh, uh, cmv uh, pneumonitis as well as a secondary complication so on the token so is there any way that way forward that we can reduce the incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia in uh, our covid patients pravin over to you yes so we have to do oral suction oral care we have to do regular oral care here the nursing job is very very important their care is very important they have to do regular oral care is most important then closed inline suction regular closed inline suctioning should be done in order to prevent the ventilator associated pneumonia and uh, at the same time we should regularly change the moisture exchange the hmv filter that we have to change as soon as it is soiled we have to regularly change it and we should also reduce the days of invasive mechanical ventilation that is another way of doing it and also the ventilator circuits should be changed as soon as possible and the position of the patient should be kept in a semi erect position so these are the things that we can uh, do in order to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia thank you so essentially um, all wrap bundle we have to cover so that we can prevent the uh, we can decrease the mortality and then decrease the morbidity and overall length of stay in the uh, icus and uh, coming to uh, um when to consider uh, uh, shifting our patient to a transplant center j to the patient uh, while on ecmo management the 2 uh, to 3 weeks time we'll see whether patient is improving in the form of uh, vitals whether to normalize the abg level phg is normalizing and pcu is normalizing and the oxygen level if you have a requirement and the other parameters like mainly the vitals blood pressure and other nerve support everything has come down if meticulously you no know, uh, patient is improving well with the ecmo means slowly we can wean from uh, no ecmo if any persistent you no know, the uh, requirement of the you know, this high fio2 and the other parameters like the abg is same worsening and the xrh is showing there is a no improvement in the chest radiographic capacity clearance so any persistent of this more than uh, three weeks time so we have to day one itself before in the echo itself we counsel the patient and attend the attend this mainly about the so need of uh, transplantation suppose this patient may not recover maximum 3 weeks or 4 weeks time so we have to enroll in the lung transplant program and we have to put the patient on wait list in the lung transplantation and the improvement occurs okay well and good and in 3 weeks time so back to ventilation and uh, you know back to oxygen and the normal if it is no improvement despite to 3 weeks of uh, no intensive aggressive treatment of uh, ecmo supportive care no improvement means so we have to enroll in the patient's uh, uh, lung transplant program and uh, not do in the listed in the lung transplant list and slowly again we need to support this uh, no the uh, lung failure we have to give the adequate rest to the lung with a minimal ventilation and the uh, no ecmo point of view we have to maintain the same rotation per minute and the sweep rate flow rate everything we have to support till the organ is you no know, ready so till the time we have to do the proper uh, ventilation and the ecmo to take care of the oxygen status and co2 status and other parameters overall the any infection rate and other complications we have to meticulously monitor till the lung is ready so we have to you know do the transplant uh, so in a meticulous way so this is the way we do it in our center in chennai yes i remember you started uh, with you a uh, question how much it cost uh, costs for the patient for ecmo per day you said roughly around 1.5 to 2.5 lakh per day yes how much a lung transplant if uh, uh, um, would cost that's for uh, 
common man i uh, uh, is very important and then for uh, practicing pulmonologists even more important to refer to uh, transplant centers we have to prepare uh, our uh, uh, patient families regarding cost of care fully uh, yes Roughly. yeah so today also is i had a package yeah this is the package is there today also i had a patient uh, referred by one of my ima colleague to me for uh, uh, lung transplant involvement and opinion this patient is uh, severe ild with uh, no respiratory failure requiring uh, eight liter oxygen to keep the saturation above 95 Our rate is around hundred and one ten. So this patient is on respiratory failure, ILD. So this is age group wise, it's a fifty two years old year old age the female patient. Definitely, she requires the uh, curative treatment in the form of a lung transplantation. So we told very clearly, discussed with our transplant pulmonology and the team. So the package rate approximately it will come to around forty to fifty lakhs to start with. Forty to fifty lakhs. If if at all no complications after the lung transplantation. Maximum ten days period. If there are no complications, so one to fifty lakhs as a package, so we can discharge discharge patients in a good manner. If at all any complications, sometimes it may require another one week stay in the hospital with ECMO support and ventilator support and other parameters. Means uh, daily an average it costs around fifty to one lakh rupees. So an average minimum fifty lakhs, so maximum seventy five lakhs. Also, some of the patients they have to spend. So this is the package in Tamil Nadu. We have a Chief Minister Extended Insurance Scheme. From the insurance scheme, Tamil Nadu government is providing the lung transplant people of Tamil Nadu 25 lakhs for the lung transplant people. 25 lakhs. So remaining amount they have to you know organize through this uh, patient the own money or some of the other NGOs, other organization. So we have to collect it. So the package wise, uh, 40 to 50 lakhs approximately the lung transplant packages. Depends upon the uh, complication and the uh, extended stay in the hospital, etc. Right. Thank you. And uh, this brings uh, uh, to announcement as uh, we have had uh, almost uh, uh, we are being watched by close to 800 plus colleagues across India. That's a brilliant number. Thanks uh, for the trust on CCI, uh, my dear um, colleagues, and. Um, uh, can we go for you know since all the questions which have been uh, uh, covered invariably those who have asked and then those we have you know uh, being discussed in talks and all those things almost it is we came to we, uh, end now so any one liner statement you want to give dr j in terms of care of uh, uh, ecmo patients yeah So considering the ECMO, when to give, uh, when to consider the ECMO. This is a very important. ECMO is the only supportive treatment. This is not a curative treatment. So this needs a meticulous, uh, you know, counselling and the complex treatment. So any patients on uh, the ventilator support, patient is not improving. You know, after maximum ventilation, prone positions and other moderative management. The uh, FiO2 ratio, PiO2, PF ratio is less than uh, 60. For more than six hours, our pH is less than uh, 7.1 due to CO2 retention. So this is the patient we have to refer to the uh, ECMO center. If the, the same center is not having any ECMO, we have to refer the case to ECMO center for the support to you no know, uh, bridge to recovery or bridge to transplantation. So this is the way we have to give the you no know, uh, counsel to the uh, patient and the non ECMO center uh, team of doctors. We tell. So don't delay. This is the timing. Timely intervention is uh, very very important to save the patients. So timely intervention means this is the thing. PF ratio less than 60 for more than six hours. Patient is not improving after prone position after all the parameters and the pH is worsening. Respiratory acidosis, full fledged ARDS not improving. This is the time you have to think in terms of support for recovery or the uh, transplant. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Virender. Over to you for final comments. Definitely what. So whatever we have said and discussed, but the most important thing, what I think is our clinical judgment during treating these patients, and what we see daily, uh, what is the progress or what is the condition uh, that will uh, that will lead to our further uh, treatment of these patients. That's what I want to say. Thank you, and uh, go to Pravi. Final yes. comments. Yes. Uh, during weaning, always uh, look for the patient from the day one whether he is ready to wean or not by looking at the readiness to wean criteria. That is, 
satisfactory oxygenation, whether the patient is hemodynamically stable, the level of con consciousness, the cough and secretion, whether present or not, I'll look at the rapid shallow breath in it so that we can wean early and we can uh, shift the patient to the room from the ICU as soon as possible. Thank you. So, uh, it was uh, for the past one hour, it uh, went on like just 10 15 minutes. I thoroughly enjoyed moderating this session. Thank you, my dear uh, panelists and speakers, Dr. Jairaman, Dr. Virendra Bhai, Dr. Praveen. Wonderful, you know, interacting with you. Looking forward for many more uh, interactions with you all through CCI. And uh, <clears throat> we have had a very wonderful uh, technical team who supports like anything uh, round the clock. Dr. Vin, uh, Mr. Vinod, Puneet, Amit, uh, brilliant uh, support to uh, CCI. Thanks, Sipla, for uh, this um, unconditional support from the beginning of pandemic. Now we are into beyond uh, two years and your support means a lot to us. And uh, nevertheless, the backbone of CCI, Krishnana and uh, Ravi Dosi, Dr. Narayan Pradeepa, Dr. Atri, and Dr. Narendra Mithuku, and all other team members. <laughs> okay, they are all uh, uh, relentlessly working hard uh, to give something new always. So, uh, with this closing remarks, uh, I would like to uh, bring it to everyone's attention who are listening or who are in, uh, please continue to uh, support CCA. If you are not joined CCA yet, please do join for a very good, wonderful round the clock discussions that happens in the CCA WhatsApp groups. And uh, uh, mechanical ventilation of a patient is both art and a science. Combine science with some degree of art, your experience and uh, experts guidance even today okay uh, however we grow there's a lot to learn okay however senior we have become there is a lot to learn discuss with uh, your senior colleagues in cca whatsapp groups that will give a lot of lot of confidence yes imagine, uh, sometimes what happens is i may be practicing something and uh, you listen to uh, dr you know uh, mugli mohan sir saying uh, that yes, I approve it. Go ahead, Dr. Nagarjuna saying, Dr. Hari uh, Kishan saying, and so many seniors saying and approving. Dr. Rajada saying, yes, this is the way way forward to manage such complex case. That gives a lot of lot of lot of confidence. And uh, with next week we are going to come with a unique concept of uh, uh, how to maintain healthy relation. It may be doctor patient. Doctor, doctor, between colleagues, doctors with our uh, administrators. And uh, uh, on the topic, we are going to come. Please stay tuned to CCA Thursday webinar program. And thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Vijay. Vijay, sir. You are conducting a very nice, thank nice you, session. And thank you. Thank you, Krishna, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone from CCA. Thank you for opportunity. Thank you.